the core of the human resource development field. He was therefore a great human resource development visionary in terms of the modern management jargon. And his contribution in any case lives in this fine complex of institutions and therefore also in the Medical Institute of Management. I think this institute is blessed by his name. But I do believe that there is a great deal in the name under which an institution is started. Dr. Vedika started way back in 1957, which takes me back to where I started my teaching. That's my gift into the field of education. And he wrote like a colossus over all these years from 1957 to 2004. There cannot be a greater tribute to him than work ceaselessly and bring out work which will make people aware of his contribution and inspire them by his example. And I therefore congratulate the management of Vidya Prasad Pandi to have thought of this uh, series for perpetuating the memory of this great soul and for spreading the message which was really the core of his uh, life, the place of death as it were of his life, the cause to which he really devoted his life. No wonder that people in this area have the feeling that he is somewhere around. This is a head of ground, I must say. And it is a privilege to be here on this ground. I must also compliment Vidya Prasarat Mandu on the great work that it's been doing in bringing out these publications. The one on the laws and judgments and other material pertaining to institutions is most timely because having withdrawn from all other fields, the government today is focusing its onslaught on education. And it would not let educational institutions rest in peace or grow in peace. And is therefore out to regulate them by all means. Regulation is in the hands of people who are the least qualified to do that. And is with certainly nefarious motives in his, his, his populist uh, objective. At a time when even Buddhadev uh, in West Bengal admits that socialism has not been brought, cannot be brought in and we have to operate in a capitalist framework and make the best fit. At that time, the government is hell-bent on interfering with education, tinkering with every aspect, be it admissions or be it fees, as Mr. Berger in his very impassioned brief uh, said just now. Something that I think uh, this institute certainly should, should highlight, has highlighted, and should really make known to everybody by this disseminating the book that has been brought out here. So my congratulations to you on this also. I am a foot soldier in the field of management education. I started teaching of course way back. But if I count my years in the field of management education and training, count up to about 30, 35 years now. And therefore, whenever there is an opportunity of this kind, when I have to deliberate over something which means so much to the management of 
the organizations of various kinds. I do welcome this opportunity. I must uh, therefore thank Dr. Murthy and the management of Vedakar Institute, Vidya Prasad Mandali, for inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity. I cannot only like to Narayan Murthy, but in my own way, as a foot soldier in the field of management education, I have tried to contribute and ensure that we leave to posterity institutions which can keep the light on as we light at this time at this point. Let me come to the topic of this uh, morning, leadership for Asia's winning edge in the globalized economy, role of management education, long and maybe somewhat pompous uh, uh, topic for morning session, but I thought we could go over this area because this is the, the topic of the day, the talk of the day, and we certainly need to take note of it, deliberate over it, reflect over it, and see what it means to us.
and facilitate the flow of goods, of course, subject to the protection of their own interests. So the juggernaut moves on, and I think it's difficult to stop that. In this context, Asia is, has become resurgent. We know that the first millennium was Asia's, because Asia was at that time the storehouse of innovation, mathematics, zero, you know, all those concepts, astrology, all kinds of calculations, all contributions in terms of knowledge emanated from Asia. Therefore, the first millennium truly belonged to Asia. In the cycle of history, the second millennium now belongs to the West, because the West dominated and relegated Asia into the background. Asia was pushed into the background, and uh, this was done through political means, enslavement, colonies, and robbing Asia of its own sort of of its resources, to enrich the poor countries of the West, and the West became rich, Asia became poor. Whether it was India or China, or any other part of the world, Japan, of course, came up later, but then even that was uh, very much crushed. And now we come to the third millennium, where we again find a resurgence of Asia. Resurgence because you have an emergence of Asia once again. Asia is resurgent and is becoming the global force. It has a new role to play in the world economy. Today we are moving towards Asian unity because one of the things that the West did was to divide up Asia in several ways by colonization. Today, Asia does see the need for this unity and you have a large number of trade pacts, particularly being forged, nations coming together in regional pacts like the ASEAN, for example, or uh, we have the SARC here. And we also find now signs of dialogue between ASEAN and SARC, India being invited to meetings where so far only ASEAN countries were invited. So India is again included, China is included, US of course does visit these meetings from time to time because the US is still the super boss. But the development of the, these pets and these meetings of various Asian countries is in itself a very welcome portrait. I think it certainly points to us uh, coming unity in Asia. It has become the engine of growth for the world economy because a lot of uh, know-how, a lot of uh, support for the world economy is being provided by Asia. Whether it's China, which keeps flooding all the nations of the world, including the United States with its products, or India, which keeps flooding all the nations of the world with its people. So you have products coming from China and uh, people coming from India, often particularly in the field of IT, capturing market after market, one, one market after the other in the Western world. Asia's foreign forex reserves at one, one estimate came to about 2.5 trillion, which is two third of world's total two-third of world's total foreign forex reserves now um, uh, belong to Asia. And I think one very uh, great symbol of Asia's progress is that it is no longer just imitating as it was in the beginning. It is moving from imitation to innovation. Take, take Japan, which has certainly been spearheading a lot of innovation. China which also is getting into innovation of its own, and India, which is no longer producing just copy cats, and is bringing up its own new product designs and new products. I think there is certainly a movement from imitation to innovation, which is a very welcome step. And 
We have therefore two giants emerging in the world today and this emergence has been noticed and acknowledged by the leaders of the Western world, India and China. Mendelssohn, who is the Commissioner of the European Union, observed some time back that the emergence of Asia and uh, of Asia, that is in India and China particularly, is a welcome development both for them and for the West. And he was talking about the relationship between uh, these uh, blocks. Now, where does India fit? And my uh, hope here is that I see India as the emerging star of Asia. Emerging because it hasn't fully arrived. It takes time to arrive. In fact, you never arrive, you only reach. But the great report which dealt with Brazil, Russia, India and China, Goldman Sachs, predicted that India will emerge as the world's third largest economy by 2040. 2040 is not too far. They already moved towards 2010. It's a matter of about 30, 35 years that India will emerge as the world's third largest economy. Of course, we would like that to be changed from third maybe to second or first but at least a third. We have a moving capital market, the evidence of which is splashed across the papers every day in the mornings. If there is a slip of 200, 300 pound points, you know, people are alarmed, but then we don't uh, talk about the 11,000 which has been scaled by the Bombay Stock Exchange. We have become the world back office because all back office operations of large multinational banks and other organizations are now being pushed into this country. Something, you know, which does utilize the great talent that we have and more is going to come here. We have a great demographic dividend. Population was always considered to be a liability of this country. Although people did assert that population gives you the human resources. But you know, we have all been talking about population control. But over a period of time, China has come to a state where population is creating a problem. Population control has, is creating a problem. Because they were restricting themselves to one child, a family. And today they have come to a stage where there is a kind of crisis brewing of labor availability or supply. They are getting short of labor and labor costs are mounting. It's already almost about 20% increase in the labor cost uh, in China, which really cuts into the competitive advantage that we have built up. On the other hand, although we have been cursing our population as trying to control it, legitimately, rightly, Balthus always decides, you know, in our minds, the specter of uh, famine and other poverty certainly looms large in our minds all the time and we have to guard against that. But the fact is that uh, our median age in India is lower than that of China and the other countries of the world. This is a significant uh, uh, asset because in, in, in future you know, this young, young population is certainly going to yield rich dividends for the country when the other countries of the world will, will have aging populations. We also have now R&D capabilities, which also means that we are moving up the ladder. It's not just uh, the uh, kind of menial jobs, the back office jobs, the call, call center jobs, but now we are into knowledge processing and we are into designing innovation. And uh, I have referred particularly to the uh, John Welch Technology Center of GE, uh, which employs about 2,400 scientists and engineers, which I think is again a very really happy development.
But I think uh, the last government uh, lost a lot of India shy. But that cannot prevent India from shy. It's not just a matter of political slogan mongery. We are not into politics here. As professionals, we do see India shining. No matter who claims the credit. In fact, it's very difficult to attribute credit. But certainly, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who initiated these reforms, as you very rightly mentioned, sir, can take the credit for initiating something which has borne uh, dividends now. And it's a matter of uh, joy for us in a way that he is here when the dividends have started flowing. So we have a vibrant economy about which we keep talking every day, a very fast and fastest growing economy, moving capital market, burgeoning for an exchange reserves, although there are people, you know, who would say that this is all hoax and uh, all these reserves, etc., are the gift of the masters in the US. But I think these reserves are very much here, they are available to us. And point exports, which have been rising. But the question is, uh, can India be the leader? And you very much wish. It might appear to be a far-fetched hope. But I must say that I am a die-hard optimist. And that's what kept me in the field of education, because education is about hope. Today, an educationist or educator gives up hope about developing people, improving people, doing things, it will be the end of education. And therefore, I believe that India has the challenge and the opportunity to be the leader in the world. True, it has the brakes of democracy, because democracy does slow down in many ways the growth of infrastructure, the growth of education. You know, there are diverse elements represented in the parliament and the assemblies who pull uh, the country back to their own sectarian and short-term interests. But, again, there are also statesmen to make up for them. The welcome sign is that we are now shifting our focus from borders to business. Borders have held us back for a long time. Kashmir, most of all. The Sino-Indian border again was hot and therefore marred the relationship between India and China. Today, whether it's India and China or Japan and China or Korea, you see in Asia today, the focus is turning from talk about borders to business. In fact, there are two tracks operating. On one track, they keep talking about borders because that must be done to keep people happy. If you stop talking about Kashmir, people in India and Pakistan are going to be very unhappy. But you also have the other track open, the other channel open where you talk about business. What can we do to uh, start trading with each other, start helping each other? So you still have the, uh, you know, version uh, oil pipeline being approved, even when U.S. is all the time planning to attack Iran. But this is the world of uh, interesting paradoxes in which we live. But in the midst of all these paradoxes, I think, there are these challenges and uh, opportunities for India. And if you look at the challenges, yeah, you know, the number one challenge, of course, is the poverty. My point is whether poverty is a challenge that can be turned into an opportunity. Given the kind of shortage that China is going to develop, particularly in the matter of unskilled labor, because you know they have also developed the skills of people and their population is growing short, the unskilled population or marginally skilled population of India perhaps could become a great asset. I see in the years ahead a tremendous opportunity for India to utilize its population in the rural areas. If only we can step up education and get these people to 
understand work and work ethos. The character crisis, of course, is certainly plaguing us, but then very tana khuda ka bhi khana kharab hai, you know, we are not the only ones in the world. All the nations do have their own character crisis. I think uh, Japan had it most when it was uh, progressing. China has its own problems. Russia had its own problems. So has US uh, its own problem of kickbacks and so forth. But I think we certainly need to do something about this character, the principles on which we shall work for the nation. The breaks of democracy, of course, are both a challenge and an opportunity. Politicization of issues, everything gets politicized, including education. And that's why education is, is the uh, focus of so much of attention from people who are not engaged. Uh, you have a regulatory mindset, which is again a great challenge because it's going to hold back. Manmohan Singh realized it in the field of government long back. He needs to take over education or give it to somebody who, you know, will not use it to his advantage to score points over him, as Arjun Singh is doing. Inadequate investment in education, I think we are not able to invest enough in education. On the other hand, we have opportunities in democracy because we have divergent views and we don't have to keep suppressing. That also requires a lot of investment. We have an advantage in the matter of language, English language, which you know, one can talk with facility and understand with facility. Unutilized labor, we have a large pool of labor which can be utilized. We have leadership capacity which is evident at various places. While on one side you have disgraced leaders at various levels, we also have shiny examples of community leadership in various places. Pani Panchayat in Maharashtra, for example. You know. uh, and we also are beginning to develop the killer instinct. Now, in, in the matter of competition, we are no longer diffident. We are you know, getting out to kill. For example, Honda can now stand, I mean, the hero uh, group can stand on its own. All right, we don't need you. You know, uh, Bajaj people can stand on their own. Maruti can stand on its own. You know, so today we have developed a new fine found confidence, which I think is certainly great for our future. And we are talking of a growth over 8% from the Hindu rate of growth now to somewhere around 7 8%. And even 10% that China was able to achieve, I think, appears to be within the realm of possibility. Let me now present to you uh, a possible shift gears. If we have these challenges and these opportunities, how do we really make use of them? And here is a puzzle which says, well, there is a word which is on everyone's lips. The young attack it and the old grow mistful for it. Parents are lost it and police seek it. Experts crave it and artists burn it while scholars want it. Philosophers reconcile it as authority with liberty and theologians, theologians demonstrate its compatibility with conscience. If bureaucrats pretend they have it, politicians wish they did. Everybody agrees that there is less of it than there used to be. And I have uh, uh, attempted this guessing game with several groups, particularly uh, corporates and all kinds of uh, uh, replies uh, do come up. Authority, of course, is ruled out because it's part of this quotation itself. People talk of power and character. There are so many things that are lacking in life today, and therefore all of them are brought out by people. But if there is one word that comes to you readily, any guess? Leadership. And this is really the opening quotation from one Danish book on Peter. I'm very fond of it because I think it very succinctly brings out the lack of leadership in the world. You know, parents have lost it. What can be true other than that? And of course, 
So he is seeking to come. He will never get it. Uh, so you, this is leadership and uh, we are talking of leadership because I sincerely believe that without leadership you cannot have your way. India cannot really shine and uh, become the star of uh, the leader of the world unless we have the right kind of leadership. But we must say that as far as India and China are concerned, you know, uh, India cannot afford to be complacent because uh, there is a leveling up taking place. I am quoting yesterday's paper which quoted the false study of uh, business owners in 30 countries and uh, they compared, you know, the barriers to expansion in the perception of business owners all across the world. According to their perception, in the matter of language, they said, language is a barrier according to 28% in China and 24% in India. 24 and 28 are dangerously close. We always thought we had a tremendous advantage over language. But today, we are getting close, so beware. You, know, you can't take that advantage too long for granted. Political instability is perceived by 36% to be a factor in China and 31% in India. Quite strange. That's the perception that we have been able to create in the world around us. Exports. Perception is that uh, as well as uh, uh, India is concerned, uh, you know, 45% SMEs, 25% turnover, and as far as India is concerned, 31%. So that there we are. Uh, China, India, threat and opportunity. You know, as far as the upbeat feeling is concerned, we certainly score. We have 93% Indians you know, who reported to be upbeat about you know India. Uh, being the leader, whereas 79% Chinese actually expressed this view. So the whole point is that India and China appear to be leveling up and therefore there is need for India to attend to its problems, attend to its challenges and make use of its opportunities so that it can capture the leadership of the world. You can't take this for granted too long because others are catching up. As you know, in the matter of BPOs, today uh, language training is taking place in China and Russia and many other parts of the world because they see tremendous opportunities that India has been able to capture. So, don't bank on these opportunities too long. Now, the role of national leadership. And I have uh, given here a definition of leadership which has all these P's of leadership. It's the passionate pursuit of progressive purpose with impassioned people. And I have uh, put in into brackets because I want to use passion, passion to be. To be happy. And if you see passionate pursuit, well, I think uh, we still don't have the passion to pursue our goals. We are still rather hard. The passion that we need to build up brand India, to see that we become the leaders is still missing and our leadership also hasn't really got this passion. It is slowly perhaps getting on to it. The pursuit is also half-hearted because we have lots of distractions. We get distracted so often, you know, by all kinds of issues, local issues and, you know, national issues. So, you know, our pursuit of uh, national leadership is also, to my mind, half hearted. Progressive vision, the purpose has to be of shifting goals, which I think is taking place to some extent. We do keep shifting our goals from time to time, reviewing our progress. You know, so, I think we are doing fairly well there. The people, to my mind, haven't as yet got charged with passion. And without passion, you cannot never achieve greatness, whether it's an individual or 
organization to organization. And that I think is the real challenge for leadership in this country. Can national leadership create a passion in this country for progress, for progressive goals, for achieving greatness? The role of leadership in drawing upon the literature on leadership is manifold. There is the concept of servant leadership which says that the leader has to be a servant. His role is to serve the group, the society, the community. And in some ways I think the present leadership does have that element of service leadership. To the extent it becomes selfless, to the extent it has character, I think it is. It is about contribution, not about gains. And I think we certainly do, are not very high of that because most people are bothered more about their gains than about their contribution. It is about stewardship, stewardship of the community, of the society, which again is lacking to some extent. The national spirit itself is relatively weak. It is about development which I think is taking place to some extent, and it's about business. Now, Stephen Covey, with whom's name I'm sure all of you are familiar, has brought out the concept of leadership as a choice. There is a formal leadership which is based upon position. You get elected to a certain position, but leadership as a choice based on moral authority, something of the kind that Mahatma Gandhi exercised, is something that we need in this country, where right makes might, not the other way. It's a right that will have the, all the might, where integrity is loyalty, where you have the, the uh, Assertiveness to say no if you think something is uh, not desirable, not required for the country. You don't yield to populist views. And in some ways, I think Manmohan does tend to become stubborn here and there. But perhaps a bit more of that is needed. The wrong is in doing wrong. That we apply ethical norms and say what is right, what's wrong wrong, if you're doing wrong, so we won't do that which is wrong, even if it means a little threat to our uh, power. Be a model and not a critic. The leader has to be a model and not a critic, and to be rather than to do. <coughs> that means he has to present a role model. And uh, in terms of leadership models, uh, here, you know, uh, Stephen Gavi has given an interesting uh, kind of basics uh, of choice based on moral authority and position of formal authority of the society. These are the two approaches to leadership, one based on position of formal authority, the other based on choice of moral authority. And he has given various combinations, you know, high and low, uh, on both these. And you have here, yeah, Hitler has an example of somebody who was very high on formal authority but very low on moral choice. There was no question of ethics or anything, you know, you governed more by personal greed and so called interest of his uh, own land. Mahatma Gandhi, on the other side, did not have formal authority, but his leadership was based on moral choice. That therefore is the other one. The other thing has uh, most of the celebrities are in this. They are being formal authority may not be much, but people are you know still accepted as leaders because they have the moral choice to lead. The, but the ideal combination obviously will be uh, this one here, and he puts George Washington there by virtue of his position and the manner in which he operated as a leader. And I would put Manmohan Singh there, but I think he has 
that combination of the two. He has that uh, uh, power to assert even when the whole world here appeared to disagree on the nuclear deal. He went ahead with it because he thought that this was truly in the interest of the country. He showed a lot of grit in that and therefore I would say that this is the kind of leadership that we really require. Uh, here I have uh, tried to present to you uh, two contrasting models of leadership. On one hand, we have the, what I call the Manmohan Murthy model, the MM model, which is uh, Manmohan Singh and uh, Nanai Murthy. And on the other, we have the Bush Blair. The world of politics today, the Bush Blair combination is perhaps one of the most ominous combinations that we have had. Right. And if you look at the characteristics of these, you see gentleness, firmness, relentlessness, humility, both, you know, I have a strange kind of humility about them, great people, but very humble. I have known them most over the years when he was a professor at. Uh, the School of Economics, and both of us were young protestants at that time. But right from those days, you know, he has been very self facing and very humble, and yet very firm in his own way. Uh, ethical in his approach, very, very proper, even when he was in reserve bank here, he was known for observing propriety. Never, even on small things, he never really uh, tripped over. Disciplined in his life, progressive, very progressive in the sense that he brought about a reform that you find and uh, it was considered to be an anathema. And uh, he is leading the nation on to the path of progress. For example, he is the one who is espousing the Metro for Bombay. You know, when uh, the Maharashtra government is busy elsewhere uh, putting its resources elsewhere in the state. Very professional in his approach, in the sense that uh, he is not known to be swayed by sectarian, communal, or you know, petty considerations, and he is very objective in his decision making, very sensitive, you know, does feel the pain of the people around him, and pretty principled and is prepared to stand for his business. On the other hand, if you look at the behavior of both Bush and Blair, the combination, you know, the ominous combined, you have the leadership based on love, you know. I mean, Iraq was accused of uh, harboring nuclear weapons when they later on found that there was nothing much, not as much as he alleged. And still persists with their uh, ideas, although the world has disproved them. They are bold, of course, and rash. They are pushed ahead in spite of the fact that there has been so much of opposition which is certainly to, uh, you know, a positive point for them. So they have acted out a vendetta, I mean, revenge with one country after the other. Therefore, we don't have that humility here. A lot of arrogance because both are uh, belong to rich countries, one putting on the uh, whole demand to the uh, coat tail of the other. Uh, insensitive in many ways to the misery and the suffering they have caused. Resourceful, of course, in their own way, because they were able to mobilize a lot of world around them. They had the courage, certainly, to do what they thought was right, although it was not, and they put many of their way. Now, this is uh, the combination on this side, which I think is the prevailing uh, style of leadership in most places and across the world. Bush and Bia, represent the combination which literally rules the world, whereas Manmohan Murthy is a combination in India, which to my mind holds promise for future. And that again is a factor which I would like to consider as a positive factor in favor of India. Because it's this kind of leadership which is ultimately going to prevail. Now uh, here again leadership for India's uh, leadership, how to, to make India a leader, what kind of leadership will be needed, you know. We cannot advance only on economic growth. Economic growth is certainly important, you know. 
But just economic growth we have seen does not give us a solution to all our problems. The problem of poverty control, or the problem of ameliorating uh, the downtrodden, doing something for the poor people, the poor sections, the deprived sections cannot be handled only through uh, economic growth. Therefore, we have need for leaders who can conscientize, create awareness in people to get people to find their voice. And we need leaders, you know, who can get arouse people, awaken people to their plight and get them to work against their own poverty and not just offer, uh, you know, morsels from uh, or crumbs from the table. We need leadership which will help people in raising themselves by their bootstraps, as they say, becoming them, becoming self-dependent, giving them projects and schemes and employment by which they can uh, raise themselves. And here, therefore, there is a combination of three things. You have personal greatness, which is vision, discipline, passion, what Bobby calls the seven habits. You have leadership greatness, the four roles of leadership, which is modeling, presenting a model to as for people in terms of their behavior, leadership, uh, uh, modeling, uh, pathfinding, aligning, and empowering, aligning people you know, in the pursuit of an objective, and organizational greatness, which is vision, mission, values, commitment, clarity about commitment, translation, synergy, enabling and accountability, these are well known to students of management. Now, As far as organizations are concerned, from nation to the organization, we need a change in organizations. It needs to be managed by leaders. And therefore, we have to move from just goodness to greatness, that he called it. And therefore, you have, a, you have to change from being inward looking to being competitive. Responding, being outward, being old and arrogant to being calm and caring. But you can't get people to achieve greatness just by uh, treating them coldly or arrogant. By being out, being quality minded from being output minded. I think we thought about quality manual here, it has not come in too soon. It has to be built in right from the beginning. From routine existence, we need to look at exciting existence. How to make it exciting for people to work in the organization. From personalistic decision making, we have to move to professional decision making. That's the kind of leadership we require. From bureaucracy to entrepreneurship. Let us not replicate the government everywhere. I mean, today, wherever people get into a position of authority, they start acting like government bureaucrats. It has to be the other way. I think the government people have to be more entrepreneurial in their uh, behavior. That's the way we are going to go. From being driven by the bottom line, the profit, we need to be value-based. We need to bring in values in the organization. From being flabby, we need to move towards being clean because today we cannot afford the extra costs which are involved in flab. From being crisis driven, we have to be vision driven, not only from crisis to crisis. From being fragmented, we have to uh, do some bonding in the organization, get people together, align them, move, move them together, have strategies to do that. And from being exploited, we have to be rewarding through fair play based on justice. From being politics driven, we need to be gold driven. These are the kinds of organizations that we need to. Uh, build up. And therefore, if we were to bring come down now to leadership at various levels, leadership even at the interpersonal level, I'll say we need to develop what we call VIP. That true leaders will be those who will make their people feel like VIPs, very important persons. But very important persons can also become very irritating persons. Uh, and uh, it has to 
provide that nursery of leadership which is so critical for an aspiring nation like ours. Now, I think this is again is a very interesting quotation in the title of the book from Venice, who says, old dicks, old dogs and new tricks. Even old dogs will have to learn new tricks. And that I think is more meant more for us than for the youngsters present here. That we have been used to some of the old methods, you know, which are implied in the left side of the uh, chart that I presented, we need to learn the new tricks of empowering and enabling and educating people. Education has to be not just for being, it has to be for being and not just for doing, and because we are employment oriented. But in providing this employment oriented education, I think we also need to remember that education for being is extremely important because if you are not able to uh, do man-making, as Jim Allen said, you will not be able to carry the nation forward. <coughs> Just on skills, nations don't advance. Nations need great people to advance, and to great, great, great people is the task of education, where you know value building is required right from the uh, childhood. Leadership, uh, obviously, has to start at the school level. We have uh, my friend Dr. P. N. Singh who set up a foundation which is doing extremely good work, you know, because it is uh, taken up leadership at school level. It, they, they have taken up a number of uh, poor schools, schools where deprived children go, and they have been able to get them to learn the skills of leadership, of public speaking and you know, decision making, problem solving and uh, doing work together. And I, it is amazing to see how you know these poor children who have been deprived of all kinds of opportunities grow, develop and uh, you know, flower forth when they are given the opportunity. You have to really hear them speaking from the public platform, audiences much larger than these to realize how these poor children can come forth and come up if they are given the opportunity. I think we need to start at that level and we wish that this kind of experiment uh, not only succeeds but also can be multiplied. Marital ethics, which means married with ethics has to be the cornerstone of education. No more influence, I think the corporate sector has already experienced it till about 15, 20 years back, or even 10, 12 years back, uh, people could speak for others and get people in. You could put in a word and make a recommendation and get a job for somebody. Today, in the management schools, we find corporates coming in to recruit. And if you put in a word for somebody, you can be sure that he'll never be taken up. It has become an anathema. Nobody is prepared to accept recommendations because you cannot have afford to have people who are not fit for jobs, extra hands, and on considerations other than merit. So therefore, merit with ethics based on fair play on the right methods and right considerations is what we need. And a community orientation is needed for the education to succeed because People need to have concern for the community uh, around them, sensitivity, and uh, should be prepared to work for the community around. Now, the role of management in education, which is our concern here, we all talk about the large number of management schools in the country. But we also need to take note of the small number of quality schools. Unfortunately, Many schools do not have the quality, kind of quality you have here. And they also are in the market. But then the solution does not lie in regulation. The ICT has never been able to establish the rule of quality. In fact, you know, I always say that the ICT has only brought in the cult of minimum. The cult of minimum, minimum. You should have a minimum area, a minimum number of students, a minimum number of faculty, with the result that 
many institutions have kept only to the minimum and have never looked beyond that. Now that cult needs to be banished. If we want quality management schools to come up, we really need to deregulate and let the un unworthy exit. That's the law of the market. I think it can certainly weed out those who don't deserve to be there. And allow for the organic growth of these institutions. Don't put them into the same mold. You cannot have management schools exactly of the same type in the whole country. Uh, same syllabus, same curriculum, same number of books, same kind of, even the list of books is provided by AICTE. Now, you cannot put them all into the same mold. Let them grow according to their own genius, according to their own leadership, according to their own aspirations. And break the numbers barrier. I think it's a very welcome statement that came from the President you know, and we have we are indeed lucky in this present age with now will be there for long. Uh, Abdul Bala made the plea that uh, we need more facilities, we need more numbers to be admitted. The ICT has been extremely restrictive in the matter of numbers. Sixty is appears to be some sacred number, you know. Can you go to institutions elsewhere in the world, you find much larger classes. But in India, somehow, we have thought of 30, 40, 60, these are the numbers to which we seek to listen. Something reminiscent of the MRTB, which used to keep the organizations to the picnic kind of size that Indian organizations came to have. It's only after we lifted those restrictions that we found that we can also grow to world size and today, you know, some organizations definitely have venerable side. So I think that needs to happen here also. Open the doors and windows. Doors for international students to come in and windows for international inputs to come in. We need to open ourselves to international inputs, something again which has been uh, kept on the hold and uh, has been barred by the policies of the AICTE. Uh, so therefore, uh, we uh, certainly need to open up as far well as language education is concerned. Uh, what should we aim at? Mids back, you know, it is famous for just about a couple of years back, said that, uh, you know, we need managers, not MBAs. Because according to him, MBAs were not being trained to be effective managers. They were not really learning management. They were learning management and marketing and various functional areas but they did not have the skills which were required. Something that was voiced earlier in what they don't teach you at Harvard. This free smartness is not taught in management schools. But I would say that uh, as far as India is concerned, then MBA is not just for creating managers, but is for creating leaders. What we need is leadership more than just management, not just managing structures not just uh, taking decisions according to the program set, but people who can take decisions, take initiative, you know, who can manage as entrepreneurs in respective areas without having to look to the central office for direction. That's the kind of leadership that we need, and people who can care and share and grow people under them. Leadership has to be academic, professional, and development not innovative. So this is the kind of leadership that we need in the profession. Now, as far as the uh, management education is concerned, the hardware of uh, management, you know, is knowledge and functional skills, knowledge of various areas, function, various functions, finance, marketing, personnel, operations, and so forth. But along with that, you also need the software of management, which has come to be seen as very critical. You may be a great uh, finance man or marketing man, but when corporate interviewers come to your campus, they do expect a desire to see people you know who have the soft skills, who have the right kind of personality, who can present themselves with an impact, who can um, carry themselves effectively, who can convince others, who can build teams, and 
therefore who have multiple intelligences. Our gardener came up with this concept of multiple intelligences. In the beginning, we talked only about uh, intelligence portion and Q. Then, of course, we came down to emotional intelligence. He has now identified some seven intelligences, which also include aesthetic intelligence. But if not those four, those seven, the four intelligences which Stephen Curry again has identified, you need the intelligences pertaining to the body, the mind, the heart, and the spirit. These are the four areas to live, to learn, to love, and to leave a legacy. And therefore, four intelligences, physical intelligence, mental intelligence, emotional intelligence, and spiritual intelligence. And then four attributes, vision, discipline, passion, and conscience, which relate to these. And therefore, four rules. One is modeling and pathfinding, which, is, uh, which relate to focus, and aligning and empowering, which relate to execution. Because leadership is not only about focus, it is also about execution. But not execution without focus. And therefore, we need a combination of these four. India is in the running. Asia is the world leader in knowledge. India is certainly a very key player in the world of knowledge today. And it has a role not only at the lower end, that it has started with, it also has a role to play in the higher end positions in the world of knowledge. In the knowledge society, India certainly is going to have a key role. And that is India's opportunity. We need to look at our opportunities and catch them. We do see the opportunities. Many of us have perhaps seen the opportunities, but can we seize them? Because if you don't seize these opportunities, don't do anything about it, if our leadership sleeps over it, we will have missed the goal, uh, the, the goal post. So that's best therefore, according to Vekalanda, that's arise, awake, and stop now. Till we lead, shall we make?